everywhere. That I know. Take one of these. Any extras? Okay. Um. the effects of original sin. And um, I'll just mention, too, that Adam and Eve, we say, were created in a state of original justice. That's the state before the fall. They were just in God's eyes. Okay? So, um, where it says here, they possess sanctifying grace, a share in God's life, great knowledge, will governed by reason, happiness in paradise, they were free from suffering, pain, inclination to sin, that's concupiscence, and freedom, or they were free from that. <clears throat> that's the state of original justice. Okay? Just write that in there, because that should be in there. Okay? State of original justice, that's what, that's what this is called, before the fall. Okay? So, State of original justice. When we're friends with God, we're just with God. When we have sanctifying grace in our souls, we're just with God. And when they disobeyed God, they lost these things. And they bequeathed to us, it's on the bottom, okay, original sin, except in the Blessed Virgin Mary, who was preserved from it because she was going to be the mother of God. They bequeathed to us ignorance, pain, suffering, the inclination to sin, which is called concupiscence. We, by nature, are prone to sin. We rebel against God against authority, and as a result of concupiscence, we have seven ways that we are prone to sin, especially. And those are the capital sins, or the deadly sins. Places G is the acronym I use for pride, lust, anger, covetousness, envy, sloth, and gluttony. Okay. So, for a test, which we'll have, Okay. Just remember places G. Pride, lust, anger, covetousness, envy, sloth, and gluttony. Seven deadly sins, seven capital sins. Now we're going to discuss that a little in a little more detail today, the seven capital sins. And uh, John Harden on capital sins and virtues. Okay, and uh, as you can see, he, he begins this article after the initial paragraph. Okay, uh, which well, that's worth reading too. Capital sins are really the basic manifestations 
of our fallen human nature. And the corresponding virtues are ways in which God wants us to grow in sanctity or holiness. Okay. I'll go down to the first um, subsection there where it says our inclination to sin. That's what concupiscence is. There's no better way to appreciate the power of divine grace than to realize how naturally prone we are to sin. We have to know ourselves. If you don't know we're prone to sin, then, then we're, we're, we're moral idiots, you could say. Okay? We are all prone to sin. And we need God's grace. What are these inclinations? Well, they are the result of original sin. At baptism, we receive the supernatural power to overcome these passions, as we may call them, but they, the urges remain. We're still inclined to sin. Concupiscence remains with us even after baptism. God gives us his life, and he gives us grace to help us to overcome our inclinations, but they're still there. Okay? The urges still remain. Traditionally identified Pride, avarice, I wrote covetousness above there too, because that means the same thing. Avarice, covetousness. Okay. Lust, envy, gluttony, sloth, anger. We are naturally proud. What does pride mean? Well, we have a built-in self-esteem that tends to make us forget who God is and who we are. We make ourselves like God every time we sin. We tell God, I'll do it my way instead of your way. And um, the mo most basic form of pride is to think of ourselves independently of God. Forever thinking of what we want instead of asking ourselves what God wants. And the next paragraph, our pride leads us to see others as means for our own self-advantage to the point where we practically define love as the value that another person can serve in our lives. <clears throat> a closely joined sin to this, uh, a sister, you could say, to a, to a brother of pride is, is vanity. And you know what vanity is? If you call a person vain, Harley Simon wrote a song back in the, when I was about your age. It was a big hit. Anyone ever heard of it? You are so vain. People wonder who that was about. They think it was maybe about Warren Beatty. Okay. It's, how does it go? You walked into the parlor, to the party, like you were walking into a yacht. Your hat pulled strategically toward one eye. Your scarf was apricot. Uh, and all the girls wish they may be your partner. Oh, you're so vain. And um, vanity is, you know, being all wrapped up in oneself. Um, how beautiful or handsome or intelligent or great I am. Okay. That's a form of pride. So uh, pride is the, the, really the root of all sin. It's, it's the, the chief, the foundation of all the other capital sins, actually. Um, next, he defines greed or covetousness, avarice, call it too. We have an instinctive desire to possess things of course, we need food, clothing, and money to provide our well-being. St. Paul says, if you have food and clothing and a roof over your head, be satisfied. Are people satisfied with that? No. Okay. Uh, there's an insatiable desire for more material things. Why do some people keep buying you know, new cars and bigger homes and more and more things? You know, consumerism, it appeals to this. Oh, this is new. Buy it. Okay. Spend your money. Uh, Father Harden here, who wrote this article, he's, his cause is being put forward for canonization. He was a very holy man. I made my priesthood retreat under Father Harden. And Father Harden had a definition for advertising, which was pretty funny. The appeal to greed. Advertising is trying to get people to buy things they don't need with money they don't have. That's what our, our advertising is all about. Okay. I'll buy it on credit, and you need this. You don't need all these things, okay? But that's greed. And uh, why do people, you know, keep on wanting more and more money? They're, 
people are millionaires and billionaires, and they still want more and more. It's, you, there's never a satisfaction. So, uh, not that money in itself is wrong, but to pursue it as if it's a god is wrong. And that's the danger of it. There's another danger to greed, especially to the acquiring of great wealth, because it brings power and prestige. It feeds pride. That's why the rich and the famous, they tend to think that they don't need God. You know, I'm self-sufficient. You know, who needs God? I've got all this money. I've got fame and popularity. And, you know, forget about God. Um, Satan knows this. He plays on this. And um, desire to possess things is greed. Avarice urges us to acquire more than we need. The same thing he's talking about here. He's just using a different word. Okay. When it becomes an addiction, it degenerates into greed. We seek to accumulate in order to satisfy our ego, to expect others to honor and praise us accordingly. Anyone ever read the Epistle to James? The Epistle to James in the New Testament. James says, if someone you know, walks into your, your church assembly and they're wealthy, oh, you fall all over yourself toward them. But if a poor person walks in, it's like you ignore them. Well, um, and the, the wealthy expect to be treated you know, with more deference, with more uh, uh, honor, People fall and go all over them, wealthy and, and famous too. You know. uh, I remember some, I was reading. I think it was uh, Mariah Carey. You know, she was a singer. You know, she was all angry because she got off the plane one day and there weren't all these fans to greet her. She expected this whole throng of people. It's like, how dare these people don't come and you know? There's not a big crowd to greet me off the plane. Well, take a pill, okay? It's just you know. Uh, People really begin to think they're, they're something. And they begin to think their opinions matter. Like, because I'm rich or famous, my opinion matters more than you. He's, you know, I, well, I could, I could use a, a derogatory term, I won't. These people who are rich and famous, who are on talk shows and think that just because they're rich or famous or popular, that their opinion has weight and value, and we should listen to them. Okay. Well, a lot of the people who are, who speak, are, 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 are idiots. You know? Sorry, they're just, you can tell by listening to them, they don't know what they're talking about. And, um, but they think they're, they're brilliant or whatever because they're rich and famous. And um, anyway, um, the next sin he talks about, lustful. Okay? The built-in desire to sexual pleasure is reserved for marriage. It's not under spontaneous control. The sex mania of the modern world is a tragic witness to the havoc that lust can create unless it is mastered by the rational will. Um, the Blessed Mother told the children at Fatima, when she appeared to them, that more people go to hell for sins of the flesh than for any other reason. That was 1917, when things were pretty modest. Okay? Um, not that that's the greatest sin. It's not. But it's a very easy sin for Satan to entice people with. Okay? And for other people, too, who are tools of Satan, you could say. You know, Satan's um, forces in the world. Uh, people who put pornography on the internet. And the, I think, I've read figures, you know, 30, 40% of the internet is porn. And, and uh, this is especially addicted to men, because men and women are not the same, in case you didn't know. Men are more prone to, to pornography. I don't know any women who are addicted to pornography. A lot of men are. Okay? They get caught in this. And it is like, it is as addictive as cocaine. They measure the brain. Okay? Very dangerous. Satan plays on this. Okay? And um, um, so lust is the, the disordered attraction to sexual pleasure, the disordered desire to have sexual pleasure. If it's rightly ordered, then where should it be expressed? Within marriage. But uh, the media and everyone else knows that it's not rightly ordered in people, and they have an inclination to, to have disorder in this area, 
So even advertising, I mean, why, why guys do you think that they have half-dressed women, almost naked women, to sell cars? Or to sell beer, okay? Is there any relationship between this? No, <laughs> there shouldn't be. But uh, in, in the mind's eye, you know, that's how to sell people. Sex sells, you could say. Okay? Um, so that's one of that's one of the ways we are prone to sin. Um, now with women, it isn't. It's it's a little different. Okay? With men, it's wanting to use women for sexual pleasure. That's how the sin of lust, the capital sin, manifests itself. With women, it's something else. Anyone guess what the weakness is in women? Well, with women, it is, it is knowing that they can exert the power over the man by uh, the way they dress, okay? immodestly. Okay. Back in my age, in my time, uh, um, we had uh, a woman, she's still performing, she's about my age, um, named Madonna. Okay. And, um, then there was Britney Spears, and now there's Lady Gaga, and you have all these, they're like clones of one another, okay, almost, in a sense. Okay. And, um, anyway, as I talked it, yes, I was informed by your classmates, okay. So, um, the women, the females know that they can exert power over the man by dressing and showing, you know, private parts or whatever, that they can exert a power influence over the man and, and attract the man in a bad way this way, because the man will look at them, not in a pure way, but in a way to use them as an object. But because women, um, um, because of our fallen nature, they can fall into this and, and want to attract men in a bad way, in a, in a moral way, through Immodest dress, for example. Um, envy is the next, and we're on the right hand column right up here, going through the capital sins. Okay? Envy is uh, a stupid sin. If you think about it, all of us are given gifts by God. Some of us are given other gifts rather than others. Okay? We can't want to have all the gifts and talents. That's what envious. I mean, you're, you're, you're envious, you're jealous of, of something someone has. Envy is the sadness okay, that we feel when someone else has something or has succeeded, which contrasts with what we lack or where we have failed. We become envious of a person. We naturally envy other people's gifts or achievements for no other reason than because they put us in the shadow. Envy feeds our pride. We're sad because you know I'm not as good as good looking or intelligent or whatever. And usually envy, we don't envy someone who's way above us. Okay? If I'm playing a one-on-one -on -one basketball game with Michael Jordan or someone, you know, I'm not envious of him because he's gonna he's gonna beat my I was gonna say my posterior, okay? And I know this. I mean I'm not, you know, but if I play basketball, a one-on-one -on -one game with my brother, okay, I want to beat him. And then I'm, we tend to get envious of people that are maybe just a little bit better than us, a little more handsome, a little more intelligent, whatever. That's where the envy comes in. Okay? That's really our pride. I want to be as good as this person, and I'm sad because I'm not, or popular, or whatever it may be. Okay? So it's really a stupid sin, because we all have gifts and talents. We have gifts and talents that other people don't have. And the grass is always greener on the other side. Oh, that person just has all these, you know, these, these good talents and abilities, well, everyone has their problems okay? and their weaknesses as well. Okay? Gluttony okay, is a disordered desire for the satisfaction of, of uh, bodily needs, food and drink. Okay? The irrational desire for food and drink. Irrational meaning it's, it's not rightly ordered. Okay? Either in quantity consumed, okay, you eat too much, you don't eat the whole box of Oreo cookies. Okay? You eat a few. Yes. Is, can the like 
feed into alcohol in the near too? Yes, that's gluttony is that. It's overindulging in drink. Having a having a some alcohol is not a bad thing. Overindulging it is bad. And that's what some people tend to do. Um, it's either the quantity consumed, okay, you eat too much or too much alcohol or whatever, or in the quality of what we eat and drink. Some people, they get so finicky, well, I won't eat anything but uh, you know, uh, designer food or whatever, because, it's, uh, because I'm, I'm so special. You know, this is a way of pride, a form of pride, too. You know. I'll only eat, uh, you know, or, I mean, some people like organic food, whatever, but to be so picky about it that, you know, I, I can never touch anything, and I'll only have the best food, and, and um, I just well, not not we're not saying that. I mean, some people for health reasons they may want to do something, but they uh, you know I'll I'll only eat the best brand of food. Okay, I won't eat you know uh, instead of these potato chips, I will eat these potato chips because you know they just they just taste better to me. Well, you know this is being too um, too fussy about our food. You had a question. What about the people that like shame put shame on other people for not? Well, and that, that could be a form of pride, though. Okay. Oh, you're not as, as, as you don't have as good, as good a taste as I do. Well, with, when it comes to, to taste for food and things like this, I mean, everyone has their own you know, likes and dislikes. Okay. Uh, as he goes on to say here, as a society becomes affluent, it desires to go far beyond what is necessary. Now we're at the bottom left-hand side, okay? Restoring to all kinds of exotic satisfaction of the palate. Okay? So, uh, you know, you, you become more affluent, more more wealthy. And uh, uh, has anyone ever seen the movie? It's 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 kind of a, it's one of my favorite movies. Uh, this is Spinal Tap. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, that was a parody of the rock bands. I mean, it was it was made to poke fun at them because this is how they act. They're so self-centered and wrapped up in themselves. And one of the things, and I know this because I used to work at concerts as a security guard, and I heard that uh, what did they call it? The, the roadies? They would they would bring in their their uh, their food. And in one of the scenes in, in this is Final Tap, uh, you know, he's picking at the food. Well, this isn't you know just at the temperature I want. And this is actually what these rock stars do. Well, this isn't exactly at 65 degrees, so I'm not going to eat it. You know, my my um, you know, caviar or something. You know, it's, it's two degrees above what I'm normally eating. So uh, here, just get it away from me. You know. Well, this is just you know uh, beyond the pale. Okay. And only the affluent do this. Poor people are going to do this. Poor people are, are just, they're happy to get food, okay? I mean, I've served food at the food pantry, or the, the you know. Uh, so they show uh, No, the. Uh, oh, the food yeah. pantry. Yes. yes. Um, is Luke here? Luke is here, yes. Oh. He just came back. OK. I was just making sure, because we saw he was absent, so I wanted to okay. make sure he He's got here. OK, perfect. Thank you. OK, sure. You were worried about the loop. <laughs> what did it mean for me to wander away? Um, anyway, so so it's the it's the affluent that will be you know very finicky about food. Okay. Now, the next capital sin he talks about the bottom left hand column, anger. Is anger always a sin? No. No. Jesus became angry. I always like to tell people, Jesus was not a nice guy. Nice in the sense that he always had a smiley face, wanting to be liked by everyone. No. No. Jesus got angry. He picked up cords and you know, was hitting the money changers, turning over their tables. You've made my father's house a marketplace. Get out of here. He spoke to the scribes and Pharisees, even when invited to dinner, and he called them, you hypocrites. Is that nice to call people hypocrites? No. He was angry when he said this. That's a just anger. If we see an injustice being done, we should get angry. If you see a bunch of 
hoodlums, you know, jumping some old lady on the street and taking her purse, you should get angry. And you may have to use physical force to stop them. So there's nothing wrong with that, but the anger that is one of the capital sins is unreasonable anger, where we go beyond reason. You see someone, you know, pushing someone, you take out a gun, you know, well, no, you don't do that. That's not the response, okay? Road rage, I mean, someone passes you, okay? I had a, I had a guy follow me all the way from Milwaukee to Kenosha. I called the cops on him. Because, you know, I, I, was, I was passing, um, going through, uh, I took a, 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 the right lane, and, you know, I, I, I cut in front of him because I had to, you know, make the, make the get in, in the right lane. He got all offended because if I cut him off, and I didn't mean to cut him off, I mean, he, he may have had to hit the brakes slightly or something, but, I mean, people can just get, you know, unreasonably angry. So our anger has to be under control. Uh, parents sometimes would confess to me, I got angry at my children. I always say, not a sin. You've got to get angry with your kids sometimes. If you don't get angry with them, they're going to walk all over you. And they're going to do whatever you want, whatever they want. Okay? You've got to get angry with them. Okay? Even the hidden children is not a sin. Spare the rod, spoil the child. Right out of the Bible. Okay? Our laws, there are these stupid laws that you can't you know, you know, discipline a child you know, physically. Well, this is, this is unchristian. Okay? I'm sorry. Um, uh, children threatening they're going to you know, report their parents if they if they pat their bottom, you know, uh, because they disobey. Well, you know, that's what they should get. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, so, anger in itself is not sinful. It becomes sinful when, when we are provoked to indignation over something trivial, okay? or when the intensity or duration of the anger is out of proportion to its cause. Okay. Then it's unreasonable. God gave us reason. But what happens when anger is sinful? We're going beyond reason. When you start screaming and you know, uh, becoming too emotional and, and, uh, and, or too violent, okay? Well, this is, this is not reasonable. And that's where, what we're prone to do. Okay? Um, it's good to take a step back, assess the situation, okay? You know, count to five, whatever you have to do before you speak sometimes, because if you, if you speak when you're angry, not a good thing. Okay? I've, I've had people write letters, and, and I say, you know, before you send it off, don't write, don't write a letter when you're angry, because You'll say things that you're sorry for. Okay? Let it sit for a day. Go and read it again. And think, oh my gosh, I said, no, I'm not going to say this to the person. I'm just, I was too angry when I was writing this. So, this is what we're prone to do. This is a weakness in us. Okay. So, um, when you're when you're the gro yeah, you don't yeah, want to go grocery. Right. That's that's what you see. You're, you're hungry and you're going to buy all this junk that you don't need. Um, now. As he says, we should never lose our temper. Okay? Control. Controlled anger is not sinful anger. Okay? And then we are all naturally lazy. We do not like to exert ourselves. A slothful person does not want to do what God expects of him. We want to take it easy. Okay? Well, uh, this, is, this is part of one of those punishments I talked about, remember reading Genesis? God said, now you will bring forth fruits from the earth in toil. Okay. Um, in, in, um, you know, we, we won't like the work we're doing all the time. It becomes bored or, or, um, or just um, we become disinterested. It's easy to make excuses not to do work. Well, I can do something else, just put this off and become lazy. We don't want to do that. Laziness can open the door to other sins, too. Um, I'll give you an example. You've all heard of King David. Now, I'm going, to, I'm going to tell you a story how, it's right out of the Bible, how a few of these sins are connected, and you see it in a real-life situation with King David. With whom did King David sin? With 
woman. Someone's wife, do you know her name? You're on the right track there, Luce. Okay. It was it was the, the soldier's wife. It was a soldier's wife, yes. It was Uriah's wife. Her name was Bathsheba. Beautiful. Okay. Now, David one day, this is this is the story in the Bible. Okay, I'm not gonna read the whole thing, it would take too long. Anyway, David is strolling up on top of the palace one day with nothing to do. You know, just wrong. Being lazy, okay. This is this is sloth, okay. Not putting our mind, heart to good work, okay? just to just to be lazy. He sees her off bathing. This beautiful woman inquires about her. Who is this gal? Now David's married. Okay? He finds out that she's the wife of Uriah, one of his soldiers on the battlefield. He says, "Come, tell her to come to me." Now, if you're a king of Israel, it's like you're, you're a rock star and a politician and a billionaire all wrapped up in one. So David is like the most, most wanted guy in the kingdom of any guy by women. Okay. So David can, like, he can have any, any gal he wants, and he calls her and has relations with her. And well, she then informs him just maybe a month later, guess what? I'm with child. David's like, ooh, this is a problem because her husband's off in battle. So what does David do? David calls her husband, Uriah, to his palace. Have, have Uriah come in here, okay? He has Uriah sit down and and um, uh, talks to him how are things going out in the battle. Yeah, yeah. Okay, why don't you go home and spend the night with your wife? So he wants him to sleep with his wife. So when she has a child, you know, everything looks kosher, okay? Um, well, anyway, Uriah doesn't do that. Uriah's a faithful soldier. He goes out right outside the palace, and he sleeps outside. And David comes and asks him the next day, well, why didn't you go down to your wife? And he says, well, you know, I can't be sleeping with my wife when my soldiers are out in the battlefield. You know, I feel bad for this. So David says, okay, well, goes to plan two, plan B. He calls him in, he has a big party, he gets him drunk, he keeps feeding him wine, he gets him feeling good. Now, go down to your wife, okay? You know, go down and spend the night with your wife, okay? He still doesn't do it. So what does David do? Front lines. He what? Sends him to the front lines. Well, he writes a note and seals it, so Uriah isn't gonna open it because he wouldn't do that. He gives it to the general, it was Abner. He says, put your eye in the front lines, have the men withdraw back. So he's, he's killed. So that's what happens. Your eye is, is killed. This is murder. So you see the capital sins, they open the doorway to other sins. Okay? You're being lazy, and then laziness led to lust, and lust led to adultery, and then to murder. Make a movie on this. Okay? And um, does anyone know how David's confronted? David repents of this sin. Does anyone know how the rest of the story goes? It doesn't end there. No, he, uh, David's prophet goes to talk with him. And um, he tells him the story. He says, um, I want to tell you a story. There was, there was a, a rich man, he had all this wealth and a whole flock of, of sheep, and there was a poor man next door, his neighbor, had one ewe lamb, he loved the lamb, it was his only lamb, and when the rich man held a banquet, he didn't want to take any of his own sheep, so he took the one sheep of the poor man, to see David had a lot of wives, the kings of Israel could have a lot of wives, he already had wives, Uriah had one wife. Okay. So, um, he didn't want to use his own sheep, so he took the sheep of the poor man, you know, uh, had, it, had it butchered and, and he feasted on that. And David gets in a rage, saying, that man must die for doing this. Because what he did was wrong, taking the one man's, this, this man's one ewe lamb when he had all this wealth. And um, his prophet, it wasn't Nathan who was the prophet, it was the other prophet of David, uh, I forget his name, but he says, you are the man, David. 
you are this man from what you've done. God revealed to the prophet what David had done. So David fasted. God forgave him. And David wrote Psalm 51, which is uh, the great psalm, the penitential psalm. I know I'm a sinner. I was born a sinner. Um, in fact, let me just read part of Psalm 51 because Psalm 51, if you pay attention to Psalm 51, which I'm going to read for you now, it talks about a certain sin. This is David's prayer of repentance, okay? Have mercy on my, me, God, in your goodness, in your abundant compassion, blot out my offense, wash away my guilt from my sin, cleanse me. For I know my offense, my sin is always before me, against you alone have I sinned, what is evil in your sight I have done, that you are just in your sentence, blameless when you condemn. So he's pleading with God to forgive him. But the next line, listen to this. This is verse 7. In truth, in guilt I was born, a sinner, even as my mother conceived me. What's he talking about there? Original sin. He's talking about his original sin, but it starts out talking about his, his personal sin, his actual sin, in committing adultery and then murder. Okay. Um, now, to go on with our article here, our invitation to virtue. In God's providence, the seven capital sins are his way of urging us to a life of sanctity. But are we saying, well, um, that what we call the capital sins are really seven capital invitations from God to practice corresponding virtues. Our faith tells us God never permits any evil unless he foresees the greater good will somehow result from the permitted evil. God draws good out of evil. What's the greatest evil that was ever performed? The greatest good came out of it. Crucifixion. Crucifixion, yeah. It's the greatest evil. We, by our sins, put to death Jesus Christ, the God-man, the greatest good that came out of it, our redemption. God always draws good out of evil. He permits it. This is his plan. Why does God permit all this sin? Well, because he gave us free will, but he's going to draw good out of it in the end. Okay? In the next paragraph, in the middle, the last line in the middle column, our human nature has been terribly wounded by sin. Because of the sin of our first parents, we lost what is called integrity. Okay? Everything was in harmony between our, our bodies, our soul, our mind, our will. We all now have concupiscence, a natural inclination to sin. But what's so painfully obvious to us is we lack the natural power to control these simple, simple impulses. We don't have the power on our own to control these influences. This is precisely why we need God's grace, won for us by Christ on the cross, not only to conquer these evil inclinations, but to strengthen our resolve to become saints. And uh, I want to uh,
I just want to point out a couple of things on that sheet I just gave you. Okay, so let's take a look at it. On page five on the bottom, there's a three and a five. Well, actually, look at look at three. Page three is the one side. Okay. Uh, question three. Okay. Man, man and woman was created in a state of original justice. Okay. What does that mean? He had sanctifying grace. She earned God's own life. Adam and Eve had preternatural gifts. Gifts that were added to their human nature. To live forever and not to suffer pain. Those were added gifts. They were not supposed to die. They were going to live forever. They had freedom from pain, no suffering, no pain. Okay? And integrity, that's what Father Harden referred to. Okay? Ability of our reason, our mind, to control our bodily senses, our bodily urges, other faculties of the soul, which meant there was a harmony, proper order between body and soul. It wasn't absolute because our first parents still sinned, but it was much stronger than ours. Okay? Everything was under the control of the reason, intellect. Okay? If you turn it over, page five, okay, um, the effects of original sin, I talked about them there. Okay? They lost sanctifying grace, Adam and Eve lost, number two, preternatural gifts. Okay. They were prone to death, prone to suffering, and they lost integrity or harmony of body and soul. And I, in the little column on the left, I said, our intellect is darkened, our free will is weakened. I quote St. Paul up on the left, the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. St. Paul says, I don't do the good what I want, that I want to do, and the good that I want to do, I don't do. He knows he's weak. We're all prone to sin. None of us are free from sin. I talk about the seven capitals. Okay, tomorrow we're going to continue.